All right, good, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, attending. I, I think I've succeeded into tricking you guys to come here with a fancy title. So hopefully I can, uh, hopefully it's worth it. All right, so Alice in Wonderland, um, you know, networking in DevOps with a splash of OpenStack. Um, I think you'll get the picture here in a little bit. My name is John Willis. I am a VP of Customer Enablement at a startup called Stateless Networks. Um, Botchik Loop is probably the best way to find me. You can, I tend to just be on Twitter all the time, right? So that's my kind of portal to life these days. Um, and then I've, I tried to put, there's a lot of references. I'm going to, I'm talking about books and really, people get really annoyed at me because they're like, John, every time you give a presentation, I have to add seven more books to my reading list. So, um, so anyway, th I put a little bit.ly there um, that it's basically just a bunch of presentations, references and, and stuff. And I'll, I'll add some more because I usually, pretty dynamic here. I'll think of other things along the way and, and then talk about some book I didn't even put there. So the overview is we're going to an introduction who I am, why, you know, why am I qualified or not to be here to talk to you guys about something. Um, you know, SDN opportunities, yeah, um, we'll go around that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk about, you know, what, what does DevOps really mean and, and what's driving it possibly for the network. Um, and then I'm going to take a little history lesson on DevOps. Um, because uh, one of the things you'll find out, I've been doing this thing called DevOps for quite a while, and everybody says that, but I've actually been doing DevOps for quite a while. I, I was at the first DevOps days in Ghent, and that was only five years ago, but I was playing around with Puppet seven years ago, so you'll get the picture shortly. And then I'll talk about, like, what's, this, what's the possibilities of networking in DevOps? And hopefully that will be the real exciting part of this presentation. Um, and so just one quick, I don't do product presentations. I, I, you know, I do when I'm with a customer, but when I, when I give presentations, I like to talk about information and kind of try to get people thinking deeply. So this is really the only slide I'm going to talk about the company I work for. Um, we, we uh, Stateless Networks. Um, we, you know, we, uh, we're web scale for networking. If you think about what Chef and Puppet have done for compute, we're trying to do very, something very similar for networking. It's a very interesting model. If you want to learn more about it, please, please ping me, and I'll give you a demo or whatever you want to know about it. We'll, we'll have lots of fun there. So, uh, so who am I? Um, I you know, it's, um, I'm an old dude. I'm actually 55 years old, and I calculated I've been doing this shit for four decades, and I do curse a lot periodically too, so if that, if that offends you, I'll try not to do really bad curse words on this one. DevOps days, we curse like there's no tomorrow. We're drunken sailors at DevOps days, but, um, so, but I'll try to uh, curl it down here. But, um, so I, I realized, that, you know, I've been doing this like four decades, and I've actually had four careers in the four decades, which is kind of cool. I started out as an IBM mainframe guy, as you wrote assembler code. If anybody's old enough to remember companies like Candle and Landmark Systems. And, um, and then I became a Tivoli guy. And, you know, if you're a little younger, you might remember what Tivoli was like. And, and I still have scars on my body from working with it. But, uh, but it was fun. And then, uh, then I, um, I got out of the Tivoli business and really started doing, uh, really focusing on, you know, the kind of open source version of that, which were originally things like Nagios and stuff like that. But it drove me right into Puppet Chef. And I actually was the ninth person hired in an ops code. I, I think on my resume, it was, uh, John Ospar says, or there's a guy out there that says he's the guy who didn't hire John Ospar. Uh, mine is going to be, I'm the guy who hired Matt Ray. Where are you, Matt? So uh, there you go. Um, that's my claim to fame. Um, so I, I did a lot of cloud. I actually recently worked for a company called Stratius, which was sold to Dell. It was a CMP cloud management platform. And today I work for um, Stateless Networks, focusing on the networks, kind of my fourth um, career, which is networking. So I'm going to take you down this rabbit hole um, here, um, and, and and so if you don't if you don't these pictures are actually from a Salvador Dali collection, which is Alice in Wonderland. So and actually I own a couple of these prints, but so um, but so I wanted to tell you kind of a story, and I'm writing a book for O'Reilly uh, called Network Operations, and the first this is kind of a short short version of the first chapter. Um, in 2007, I'm at OSCON. And a friend of mine introduces me to Luke Kinnis. Luke Kinnis, founder of Puppet Labs, has given a presentation. And I had just finished doing configuration management for some of the largest companies on the planet. And it was really bad form of configuration management. But, um, but I sit in this presentation. I see this young kid. And I'm thinking, what is this kid going to tell me about? I just got back from B of A. And you know, I've been doing. And five minutes into it, I'm that annoying student. It's like, Luke, one more question. You know, and I got my pad out. And I realized. Like, it was, it was a, a life-changing event for me, honestly, because um, I realized everything I had been doing for 10 years prior was wrong. 
And, and I realized that this was a generational change in the way we did configuration management and IT management, right? And I think most of the people in this room probably realize that. And, and it changed my life, and I, I, I worked with Puppet for a while, but my, my real breakthrough was I got to meet Adam Jacob. He hired me. I was the ninth person in ops code. And then... Um, and had a real blast. But the, one of the things about, like, the minute I saw Puppet, I got it. I was, like, totally in, like, this abstraction, infrastructure as code. Like, it, it all made sense to me immediately. But I got, I sat down with Luke, and we had a cup of coffee. And, and he was explaining his vision for this. And I was like, Luke, you've got a great project. This is great. This is going to be able to, he says, well, John, let me tell you the real vision. He says, operations is going to become like software engineers. And I'm like, you know, if you ever saw office space as a lumber, I'm like, yeah, eh, I don't think that's going to happen, you know? And, and he talks about how, you know, operations are going to start, like, writing code that they're going to store in, in source control. And I was like, yeah, you know, I just, I don't see it, Luke. I just, and it took me about a year to actually, it wasn't until a year later at a Velocity conference where Adam Schaefer gave a presentation about agile infrastructure. And I realized, oh, my God, you know, I knew he was right about Puppet, I didn't believe he was right about operations becoming more like software engineers, right? And, um, and so that was, you know, that really started me on this journey of what really I think DevOps is about. It's about collaboration and engineering and software. Um, I've got this kind of elephant in the room thing. So the discussion of SDN, right? This isn't really about SDN. I think SDN is this overload. I mean, SDN is awesome. Control plane, disaggregation of, of um, switches, um, moving to control plane, open flow, all that's cool stuff. But there are a lot of forces in play that I think are driving this opportunity to allow the network engineer to start thinking, going through that transformation that I went, when I sat down with Luke and thought Luke was out of his mind, I think my quote was, that's gonna go down like a Led Zeppelin. Um, you know, the, um, and, and I think that like, we saw some, uh, some um, shifts, you know, kind of tectonic trifts, shifts that change things for compute and sysadmins. And, and I think SDN is the buzzword for that, but, but it's, you know, this is the blind men and the elephant parable, right? So, but what are the shifts, right? It is SDN, but it's also OpenStack, right? OpenStack is putting enormous pressure on classic legacy network engineering. Is there anybody in the room that disagrees with that? Right? Um, the... Um, the you know network functions virtualization open flow um, the virtual switching overlays these are all things that are just kind of driving the we've gonna have to move fast uh, and faster in all areas like we can't have these three areas be extremely fast and this area be really slow right because everything slows down it's the bottleneck right but what's even more interesting to me and what was interesting to me to me you know seven or eight years ago when I started working with Puppet and then Chef is the underlay. Right, like so, you know, we, we tend to forget the underlay. We say SDN and everything's great. Like, like there's really cool stuff going on with the you know Linux-based you know network OSs, right? Like Arista, I've got had this great opportunity to play with Arista in the last six months, right? And and the programmability of that machine is insane, right? And then you you, know, you look at what Cisco's done with the new 9K, and and you know, you can run Linux containers on these things. You're in KVM, KVM on an Arista. Like, you start putting other things in there, you know. And then you get down to something like Cumulus Networks, which is the complete disaggregation of the software. I mean, it's, it's, it's identical to what happened with Sun and AIX, Solaris and AIX, and we went into Linux, right? We, like, vendors started just buying different hardware and different software. And Cumulus Networks is, is kind of a disruptor for that, right? It's, they sell you the switch software, and they give you a list of you know, hardware vendors that you can go to and use. And, you know, and then you kind of move on, big switch, bare metal switching, they were down in the booth, had a booth the other day, right? So, the, 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 I think the meta point is, our switches are starting to look more like servers, right? And, and how we treat servers probably, or how we treat switch switches should actually be, you know, the way we treat servers. And I'll give you some data points. Um, so, seven to 10 years ago, I used to ask the question of any, every enterprise I went into is, what is your sysadmin to server ratio? And it's not a great number, and it doesn't tell you everything you need to know. But 95% of the people that I asked, and I got to visit some really big companies, the number was like 1 to 50, maybe 1 to 100. Today, in, in, a, in a, a kind of a company that's adopted DevOps principles, large enterprises that have adopted, it's one to 10,000, one to 20,000. And you know, I heard a story of like, uh, 
a company, a well-known company that is in a classic legacy that's basically about 120,000 to one ratio. Now, seven or eight years ago, if you want to, I didn't ask this question seven or eight years ago, what the ratio was to network operations or engineers to switches. I know what the number was. It was probably about one to 50. And it's kind of interesting enough, um, right now as I talk to people now, if you're not web scale, if you're not a unicorn shop, or you really haven't adopted DevOps in networking, you kind of forgot about those, those people, it's about one to 50. In fact, there's a large bank I just recently talked to told me that they have two people managing 40,000 servers, but their switch ratio is still one to 50, right? So, um, you know, I mean, that should just scream at somebody who's in charge of an infrastructure, right? Um, so in summary, um, you know, in summary, basically, um, SDN is definitely driving a lot of this stuff. And, you know, I'm not down on SDN. I just think the programmability from a guts and underlay and a, a somebody who likes to, like, really fix the, the infrastructure, it's not there yet, right? Um, like, there's a really a lot of smart people are figuring out how to put abstractions on, on open flow and, the, and flow tables. And there's projects called Frenetic and really cool stuff. And at some point, for dummies like me, I can go in and have a lot of blast. But, but right now, the underlay is really a lot of fun. And, and what's driving a lot of that is, again, network, open networking. It seems to be the norm that open source is part of. I mean, it's always kind of been part of networking, but, but now it's in your face open. Things like Cumulus Networks. Um, obviously, network virtualization is changing everything. Everything moves around. Nothing's static. Clusters become, you know, we, we get our service chaining as part of the clusters as they move dynamically. Um, and then, uh, duh, OpenStack, right? So, so I promised you a history review. Um, the thing is right now, I, I think Michael, anybody see Michael Cote's presentation yesterday? Two people, yeah, he's pretty awesome. Mike, Michael works for 451 Group. So they've recently done a survey on DevOps. And, and um, you know, I used to say about three years ago, that I used to try to convince people to go to DevOps in the enterprise to say there was this 3% club, and 90% of the 7% of people plant are in IT infrastructure are not in this club. And all you have to do is decide to do it, and you're part of that club, right? And, and, and I think the number now is like more close to the 20%, and Michael said they did a survey 451. They believe that it's about 20% of the people are adopting some form of DevOps. Um, the good news on DevOps, like my work is done, because like the memo's out, Everybody knows about it. Everybody's going to be talking about it for compute, right? When I, I know that the, the evangelism job for me is done when I go down the exhibit hall and every vendor says they're a DevOps vendor, right? Score, done. But here's the thing. It, it, like seven years ago, like we think, oh, that was easy. No, it was hard. And people tell me, well, John, when you go talk to the network, and you just, they're, gonna, they're not going to like what you're going to say. And I'm like, I know exactly what they're going to say. Like, yeah, but you don't know. I'm like, do you think those sysadmins and legacy were, like, really kind to me when I walked into their office and told them that they had to do this abstractions code, and they probably should store stuff in Git, and, and, and maybe thought about behavior. Like, Wait a minute, that sounds like those developers. How dare you, right? And, and like, we won that war, but it, it wasn't easy. So I... Um, all along the way, I, I like to make fun of things, and so I make fun of those old legacy sysadmins, and I have an archetype, he's called Bob. You, know, you gotta have a Bob in every story, right? So Bob is great, like, like Bob's, uh, Bob's got a Bob directory, and there's Bob scripts. And, and, like, and if, if digital properties could have coffee stains, they'd be on Bob scripts, right? And, and um, oh, that one was funny, come on, guys. Uh, all right. <laughs> All right, so, so the, the thing is that, and, and, you know, and Bob kept that, like, really tight, like, you know, and it literally looked, you know, it was, like, hard code to read, too, right? And there was some purpose in that, right? And, and I would say, like, when Bob dies, everything gets screwed, right? Um, and Bob was a big parallel SSH'er, right? And Adam Jacob used to joke, he's like, how many people used to do it, do, do it five? You know, and everybody chuckles, right? And, and you know, and then you, you try to talk to Bob. All right, Bob, you know, hey, I got this idea about how you can change things. And, and it's a chess match, and you know, you, the first thing he says, well, John, you know, this sounds, all sounds good, but I don't trust it. You know, this, this thing that's gonna go magically do stuff, and it might do stuff that I don't want it to do, and oh my God, like, calm down, Bob, you, you really. Like, you're gonna tell it what to do. Like, there is some DSL, and you know, it's not gonna go off and do crazy things that you don't want it to. And he gets past that, and then he goes into the snowflake argument. The, well, you, you just don't understand my application. 
it, it, it's special, right? And then you're like, okay, let me see it, Bob. I'm like, Bob, the last 10 places I've been doing exactly what we do. He said, no, Joe, Joe, look at this. Like, that's my sequel, dude. Like, okay. Like, and, and then you finally get past that. And then, and then you get to the, um, well, all that could be true, but it can never, ever, ever, ever break. My system can never, ever, ever, ever break. I'm like, okay, let's talk about failure modes. Let's talk about, you know, anti-fragile. Let's try to go that route. Like, and, and, you know, in the end of the day, you know, it took about four runs to get Bob. We used to joke at, at Ops Code that, like, if we, did, we walked out with a non-success, we'd be like, they're going to call us back in a year, you know, um, because they'll get it. And, but at the, the end of the day, it was about change. It was about the fear of losing a job. You know, all that good stuff that we all fight for everything we try to do innovative, when we try to apply innovation. But what forced Bob to change was there was this tectonics that just basically came in and changed their life, right? Like uh, the, the, the disaggregation of, of, of operating systems like AIX and Solaris, right? You know, Linux became pervasive, you, you know, um, and that was one shift. But the second shift was even more important was really ephemeral infrastructure. And that was anywhere from cloud to just um, self-service on steroids or even virtualization with real high quality self-service. I mean, the idea that people could get, go from six weeks to six minutes to get resources. And, it, and if Bob's job was, you know, it, it, in the six week scenario, it took Bob two days to do what he had to do to get it done. That was okay because who cared? But when it turned into six minutes, Bob had to go down to two minutes or he was out of a job, or he just, it didn't work, right? So that world changed for Bob. So early observations in the network world, it, you know, so for about six months, I've had this passion of trying to do this evangelism in the network space. I, I knew I was in the right space when the first five people that I talked to said, you'll never change a network engineer. Never happen. I'm like, okay, I heard that one before, right? And, and so... Uh, so Brent Salisbury, if you don't know him, you should definitely know him. He has this great side, you know, it's still being used 15 years, the trombone, right? So, and so what, what are my early observations of these network folks? And if I'm pissing you off because you're a network folk, good. Um, <laughs> all right. The archetype here is Bill, okay? And, and Bill runs accept, sex scripts, tickle, maybe some pearl. A lot of spreadsheets. Actually, by the way, there was a lot of spreadsheets for Bill, Bob, too. He did a lot of cutting and pasting. He just kind of didn't let everyone know. It seems like the network, my first observation, the network engineers are not ashamed of doing cutting and pasting. The Bobs, they were like, they hit it. Like, oh, no, yeah, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have Excel up. No, no, no. Um, that, so, but, but Bill has got the same argument. I don't trust this thing, John. Um, and then you don't understand my network. And then, you know, and then the... the ever, ever, ever break. And, and I get the break thing, right? I do. I mean, like, uh, you, know, there, you know, router protocols. I learned a lot in six months, right? Okay. I don't just walk in and say, oh, change this. And, you know, this is complicated stuff, no doubt. But I am going to mark my words, be in jail because I'm going to murder somebody. The next time I hear them say, well, John, if you bring down a server, it's no big deal. But you bring down a switch, and I say... Have you ever heard of Knight Capital? Right? And if you haven't heard of Knight Capital, Knight Capital was a poorly configured server, bad hygiene, no DevOps, that a company that lost three to four hundred million dollars in three hours and was out of business in 24 hours because a server went south. So again, I understand the complexity of networking. But don't, and like the problems we're solving, that Knight Capital, if you read the SEC filing on it, could, I've, in fact, I've talked to friends that work in high trade in, in those type of businesses, and there were all sorts of things that they were doing in quote unquote DevOps that might not have stopped it, but they wouldn't have went out of business. They would have caught it in 10 minutes. They might have not, they might, that, that server might have been rebuilt as an ephemeral infrastructure, and it wouldn't have had that bad hygiene that it had. Um, there's three people I want you, I want to thank in my last six months. For, um, for really just being people that have helped me understand a lot and just incredible people. And I'm pointing them out more for you than me. Um, if you don't know Brent Salisbury, um, he works on ODL uh, for Red Hat. He's just, you know, he's, he, he's a, a brilliant young man and just 
very open for sharing and just, you know, and the thing about these three guys is they really want to drive DevOps and networking. I mean, they're looking for guys like me. I, they, they haven't figured out yet that I'm not that smart, so don't tell them. But they, they're looking for the DevOps folk, the, the people that have been doing this, because they're like, come here, help us understand what you guys did, right? And, um, and then Jeremy Shulman over at Juniper, um, Jeremy wrote the first um, puppet. He wrote um, the NetDev Ruby Jam for Puppet on Juniper. And by the way, every time a new vendor comes out with their, their kind of net dev, they don't even change the name of the VLANs that Jeremy wrote, like the Ansible one, the Chef one. Like, it's just a, I laugh. I'm like, oh yeah, there's Jeremy's stuff again. And then we've got Colin in the room. Colin is, is to me an encyclopedia of, not, of network knowledge. I mean, I, I, when I get to sit down with him and have coffee or a beer, I, I literally feel like I should be taping him. He gives me so much knowledge. So enough of that. Um, before we get into the DevOps and networking, um, if, you, if you like anything I'm saying, I got some pointers to old presentations. Over the last two years, I spent a lot of time talking about culture. I'm a big believer in this man, Edward Deming. I believe Edward De Deming created Lean in Japan. Lean became Lean IT. Lean kind of became Agile. You can point right from Deming to DevOps. In fact, I have an article out there called Deming to DevOps. Um, and, and, um, and so the, the, the core of what that comes down to is uh, me and a friend of mine, David Edwards, we created this um, acronym called CAMS. It's reasonably sticky in the DevOps world. Culture automation measurement and sharing is how we can put somewhat a loose taxonomy around what DevOps is. And, and you know, what you'll hear most people say, if you don't get the culture right, everything else is just useless or nonsense. And it really is true. I mean, you can't just take great technologies and clone them. I mean, you have to break the bone from the way people think and how, uh, you, you can't just put Puppet in front of a network engineer or tell a network engineer to go learn Python and all will be well. Um, it, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it starts with uh, some type of cultural behavior shift. And so when I went back and I said, okay, what, if I could come up with one word over the last 10 years that has, has you know, that really kind of manifests what has been the most success in DevOps for compute, if we'll just say it that way. And it's the power of pull. And if you think about pull, there's two modes. There's the pull for change, and there's the pull for flow. And if you talk about pull for change, what are we talking about? We're talking about Git. And Git probably, I think Git, might be, when we look back in the next 10 years, more innovation was probably caused because of Git and the concept of the workflow behind Git. And you think about how people collaborate in that model. I mean, right now, it's the only game in town. And, and, and so, like, if I'm gonna go in and try to help network engineers, I'm, I'm gonna, the first part, they're not gonna like this, you know. I'm gonna teach you Git. And, and, and years ago when somebody else told me, I'm like, no, no, you can't teach chef. You can't teach people. I'm like, and now I realize I was stupid arguing against that, right? It, there's such a power in that workflow. And when you see it and, and you get it. And then the other pull is really the core of this continuous delivery thing that we've got going here, right? It's that flow. It's a pull going into, you know, I want to get something into production. What's the, the classic chain is uh, something like an SVN or a Git, well, it shouldn't be SVN, Git or GitHub, and it goes into some Jenkins process or uh, some CI process. Then it goes into some behavior-driven test development. Then it goes into production, maybe driven by something like Chef and Puppet or CF Engine, right? So those are the two things that, I, you know, like I think a lot about, like how can I try to break the bone to heal the second time, knowing what I know now, right? And, and so, I'm working on a book with Gene Kim, um, Gene Kim, uh, The Phoenix Project. We've got another book that's like ridiculously late, um, so please don't ask me when it's coming out. Um, the, it's called The DevOps Cookbook. And, and, and so we've, got, we've compiled a lot of things and hacks, and um, you know, I think um, Colin, uh, you know, it's fun for me when I first met Colin, he, you know, like, even in the DevOps world, most people don't know this, this fabulous tool called Value Stream Mapping. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing tool. It comes out of Lean. Um, uh, ThoughtWorks is a company that really, that's where I learned it from those guys. Um, it really is a flow. If you want to learn more about it, there's a book called Learning to See. Um, infrastructure as Code. 
Um, I think you, if you understand Puppet and Chef or CF Engine, you should get that. Um, you know, I'm going to run out of time like the last gentleman, so um, if you want to learn more, there's plenty of ways to learn about that. Continuous delivery you know, is the hot button for everybody in application flow. You know, how do I get things from an idea into production, and how do I make that bulletproof? And you, know, you hear the, the, the 100 deploys a day, 1,000 deploys a day. Uh, there was an Amazon presentation, if you hadn't heard this, a couple years ago, where I think they were talking about a thousand deploys in one hour to production. Now, Amazon's a weird beast, right? You know, so so is Google, right? Like, um, but but you know, so that's not a number you should like. Oh my God, I'm not doing a thousand deploys an hour, right? But but um, but in the production world, people are like you know achieving uh, spectacular things in terms of how they get things in front of customers. And if you read Eric Ries's Lean Startup book, right? Eric Ries was originally somebody who was kind of invented the n per deploys per day at a software company, right? And then got famous, wrote a book. Now he gets eight gazillion dollars to speak, right? So. Um, um, another one of the chapters that I'm, I'm working on is this um, embedded engineer thing, right? So this worked really well in the DevOps transformation in, from sysadmins and dev versus ops, where um, the idea was you took somebody from the ops team and you actually put them their responsibility to live in the devs team six months, a year, maybe permanent. And it crossed, it cased this great situation where there was, there was a change of culture, there were behaviors, there were things that the devs would say, oh, we're going to do this, and the ops guy would say, oh, no, 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 don't do that, you know, that, and they were like, oh, why? And he's like, well, because when you do that, and, and it really worked well, and I have a whole chapter about this, and it will work. So I, I'm wondering if that's going to work in the network space, right? Is there this idea to shift around, and I'm getting a nod from, from uh, Colin, um, yes, um, a Kanban. Kanban is a fabulous tool for operations or um, uh, organizations that are interrupt driven. Um, so, um, and, and again, Kanban is really another thing that comes right out of Lean. Uh, I, somebody told me the other day, and I was like, oops, I forgot that one. Somebody gave a presentation yesterday. We're talking about how the network engineers peer. Darn, I should have thought of that one. Um, right? Of course. I'm going to make some config changes. Hey, Joe, what's your schedule? Let's go ahead and peer on these changes. I mean, it's another reason why I like the Git model, because basically a pull request is a, is a collaborative change, right? Um, you know, um, I'm a big fan of hack days. You know, so if you're not inviting the network engineers to your hackathons, oh, first off, if you're not running hackathons, you probably should be, uh, internal hackathons. And if you're not writing an engineer, or better yet, your network engineers are having their own hackathons and they're inviting the ops people. And at the end of the day, it's about having fun, right? Like, you know, that, you know there, you've got to break the bone. There's got to be a sense of, I remember about a year and a half ago, I went into this large credit card company, and, you know, and it was like just, you know, classically old. You expected the worst. And we got into the war room where all these, the DevOps group worked. Um, there were Nerf pistols all over the place. There were, you know, there were, you know, the soda machines. There was a foosball table. And I was like, my heart was like... Because you only only see that stuff in, in the Silicon Valley and startups, right? And I'm thinking like, okay, if you had an artwork group that's on the fifth floor and a bunch of dirty old cubicles, why don't we put them up on the sixth floor in a war room and put Nerf pistols in there and see what happens? You know, maybe somebody at two in the afternoon you get pissed off and start shooting everybody with Nerf pistols, right? And, and, and like, it's about having fun. So what are the opportunities in this new world? I mean, there's a debate now. I have this argument, Jeremy Shulman, a lot about do network engineers need to become programmers? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I've hired some really incredible people over the last five years, six years, um, that would, each one of them would tell you they're not programmers. I would probably say they're lying, but, but the point is they're really not programmers. I had a guy, John Vincent Lucis, I hired him, right? Um, you know, he would say he's not a programmer, but no language. You know, when, when Go came out, like a day later, he basically had a whole bunch of stuff written in Go. You know, um, you know so, so what I would say this is, I don't know where the argument fails. I do know, I think the, the analogy is like languages. If you're a world traveler and, um, and, and, you know, you may not have to be fluent in like all the countries that you uh, travel to, but you better have enough language knowledge to ask like how much something costs or where the restrooms are, right? Um, you know, and I think that's my theory on, on polyglot, which is learning most, multiple languages. There are some purists that would say you should never do operations unless you know five languages and you should be a programmer. I, I don't agree with that, but I do think you, I think everybody, you know, what is it? Mark Andreessen said software's eating the world, right? And he didn't just mean applications. 
Like software is a reality in everything we do. It's network security, operations. So we really need to be part of that. And so we might not all have to be programmers, but we probably need to be adaptable enough to know to ask where the restroom is, right? Um, or how much it costs. Um, so abstraction, so how do you start thinking about flow? Maybe you keep stored configs in, in GitHub. Right? And, and maybe you, know, you keep source control. Maybe you do some form of unit testing if that's available. You, you do some type of behavior driven test. I'm going to show you something I tried to do at a hackathon where I tried to use this whole flow for store configs on Arista. Or actually use Cucumber on the back end to do behavior driven development. Um, low hanging fruit in this space. Again, early observations. You know, a lot of stuff on the VLAN stuff. You, you do a Google on v VLAN and, and kind of DevOps and or whatever. You'll, you'll shit chef, pop it, you'll get this. Uh, VLAN creation, VLAN port mapping, link aggregation. Easy kill. If that's something that's like happening a lot in your shop, then you totally miss the SDN thing. But, but besides that, um, the, um, you, you probably should be thinking about automating that, right? Like if there's three people creating VLANs like eight, nine, ten hours a week, whatever, like there's really easy ways to fix this. And, and some of the ways are stateless, we fix this. Puppet, I'm not going to go into it. Puppet has a net dev module. Uh, Chef has a net dev module. We have a Ruby abstraction module to do things like that, um, to do... Now you can get into more high order stuff, like uh, for example, like automated bills. Uh, Martin Fowler, who uh, was one of the original Agile Manifesto authors, wrote an article a while back called Immutable Servers. And I always feel like I'm gonna get punched in the throat when I say immutable switches, but, but, but we used to joke in, in the DevOps world, like is, can your server pass the throw it out the sixth floor test? In other words, if you threw the server out, could it go back to the same state um, and, and and, and the truth is, like, with our products, some other products, we're, you're able to do that now with switches. Like, if it's a leaf and a leaf spine, you can actually field replace it and put it back, um, you know, and, and it go back to the state that it is. So we're in, we're, we're there in the network. Not everybody's doing it. Uh, rolling software upgrades in the network. Like, so how do I hit a whole bunch of top of rack switches, right? It's the same story of how we did cluster updates. Like, we can do blue-green deploys for switches. Like, and if you don't know about blue-green deploy, read Jez Humble's uh, continuous delivery book. It's awesome. Um, you know, automation compliance. And here's the one. This is the hard one, right? So um, there's a company called Etsy, and they used to print these shirts like MTTR is cool, right? And so if you know what MTTR is, it's mean time to repair. And one of the things that we learned really hard, and still for it, if there's 20% get DevOps, there's probably still 10% to get this concept I'm about to tell you, is that failure is awesome. The more you fail, the more awesome it is. Like, and if you read Anti-Fragile, you kind of get it, even though the guy who wrote it is a jerk. Um, the <laughs> I'm glad everybody got that. He's not the only one he called a shithead on Twitter. <laughs> Raise your hand if the nice of Talib has, has basically called you an idiot on Twitter. Come on, please. Oh, come on. I know 15 people at a DevOps shop. He's done that. Um, so that's, that's a badge of honor, by the way. So, um, but meantime to repair, right? It's, like, it's not like trying to figure out meantime between failure and, and trying to figure out how to stop the black swan and how are we going like, to... Like, that's not the world we're going into or we live in. The world we're in now is shit is going to break. And when it breaks, it's an opportunity. In fact, there's a great story. I'm totally going to run out of time. But there's a great story where Facebook says that, you know, so they give the story, like, all these bad on a DevOps company say, our developers push to production on the first day of work. Her, you know, and, and you know, like that's this bad John. And I remember one time somebody raised a hand, like, yeah, yeah, but what, what, what if they break the system? And, and it was like so canned for the guy from Facebook. He said, that's awesome. They actually get like a bonus because if they can on the first day break our infrastructure that we've got thirty thousand people or whatever the smartest people on the planet have built, and this guy figured out how to break it, that's awesome. Good job, well done, right? So I mean, again, that's going to be a hard sell in the network space. Um, <laughs> wham! <laughs> I wish I could say I planned that, but no. <laughs> so what else? Of course, the, um, um, you know, all the stuff like, you know, if you've, if you've had the opportunity to open up the Kimono on OVSDB, VSwitch, and the flow tables and all that stuff, right? Oh my God. Give me my recipes. Give me my scripting, right? I mean, it, it's just, you know, I mean, there's so much opportunity. And, and it's early. But, like, you know, if you look at the stuff that's going on, open flow, OVSDB, um, you know, the open daylight, I mean, I'm a, I think that's going to happen. 
I was at one of the early Open Daylight Summits, and, and I was at the first uh, OpenStack Summit. And to me, the attitudes and the, and the, the hype and all that, in, in a hype in a positive way, it was identical. And it smelled to me like this is what OpenStack's going to look like in a couple of years. Um, so, so quickly, some case studies. Um, the first one is just an interesting one. It has tones of DevOps all through it. It's a telco that recently worked up. They use Arista. Um, Leaf Spine Network, um, they, they're using stateless networks, they're using Puppet Razor, Piston for, uh, for um, OpenStack, and Cloud Foundry, Service Mesh Boundary, PumGrid, okay? But here's what's cool about it, right? So it is really, we're following a DevOps model, but one of the things that's cool about it is they're kind of doing this two-stage build of these. They're, 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 they're planning big, like they're expecting that they're gonna basically do lots of clouds. And then what's even cooler is, not that they're gonna build lots of clouds for lots of people, but they're going to actually, clouds, instead of just virtual instances being ephemeral, the clouds themselves might be ephemeral. So in other words, they're asking for requests to how to deprovision a cloud. Like this cloud, this one cloud of the many clouds that we have may only exist for a month. And so the, what's cool is that, um, so one of the things we're getting involved is, I mean, literally you're rolling a rack. So imagine a world where they got all these things and they've got some trigger at 70% capacity, they roll in more racks. And then the racks get like rolled in, power gets turned on, and they get configured to a network state. And they call it the razor state, right? So, which is because the, they're using razor. But basically, it's got this base, like I'm available and ready to be used rack. It's been done through attestation. It's got, you know, everything's BIOS thing. You know, we, we kick off the, you know, so Arista has the zero touch provisioning, which is kind of a pixie boot, which then we drive Puppet, which then, you know, does Razor. And everything's like ready for the, ready to go, hot available racks for use. And then somebody comes along through an API crest and says, oh, I want to turn those four racks into an open stack. And I need the first rack to be the cloud control and the other three to be the, node, the compute nodes. And then I need this to be, these three to be you know, uh, a Hadoop cluster. And then I need these, and then, oh, by the way, I want to deprovision that one back to Razor State. You know, so, uh, so I thought that was really interesting. And, and again, really thinking about how, you know, how kind of ephemeral and, you know, thinking beyond just, we're building OpenStack and we've been doing it for four years and we got our first WordPress app up, you know, so uh, that one was funny, right? Um, the, um, and then this is the one I did a couple weeks ago at a hackathon. So I, I, I set up this hackathon. It was an SDN hackathon. I volunteered to run it. Um, I wanted to do, do a DevOps thing. Only about 10 people showed up. They were all a bunch of college kids from Cornell. And, and of course, they wanted to work on the control plane and, and do SDN for WAN. So I had to do it all by myself. So I didn't get to complete it. But the idea was um, this kind of flow that I've been talking about. And, and I've gotten this idea for a couple of customers. I can't share what the customers are giving me. But literally, they're storing their store configs using either Ruby templating or uh, Ginger, which is a Python templating mode. And then they're actually storing them in GitHub. Uh, when they do the pull request, they're actually running them through um, kind of a Jenkins build. Um, they're, they're using Vagrant to set up mock environments. Um, you, it, if it's just like some of the OpenStack stuff, you, Mininet, but if it's like, like if it's Juniper or it's Arista, um, there are virtual appliances. Arista has this VEOS. So imagine the scenario where you're configured a, an MLAG pair with a, a fake spine as three VEOSs, and you made the change in the config in GitHub, you made the pull request, it got built, um, the images got started, it got configured, and then you ran Cucumber to go ahead and ask a question. Um, is my AMLAC pair up, right? I mean, that's pretty cool, right? So um, that's about all I have. A um, couple things, and, you know, I would say uh, CAM's not AMS, right? Don't forget the culture. Um, the, it's always about the flow. People ask me who this picture is. I, since I ran the shirt, you know, you know, but it's Edward Deming. I think if you really want to know all the answers, start with Deming, honestly. Um, um, it, it all starts to make sense when you when you go through and you understand everything that's happened from lean to agile to um, so and, and the last thing I'll say is that um, you know I mean th th there are a lot of DevOps people actually a lot smarter than me that are hanging out there that you just need to, uh, you know I've been lucky enough for guys like Colin and Brent to tap me on the shoulder and say hey can you help us understand this a little bit more um, like there's a lot of us out there and if you're a network engineer or you're somebody who wants to get your network engineers to start understanding this go tap your network dev. Explain to them not to be cocky, though, because, it, you know, not on, and I always say that, you know, don't let your enthusiasm look like arrogance. 
you know, you got to be real careful there. You know, you don't come in and say, oh, you're idiots. You know, you could be doing that all with configs. Like, well, no, I got some really complex router protocol definitions. You know, you know make that sure they understand that. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you very, very much.